How can you lead when you're not in charge? Have you ever thought about that? The reality is that most of us aren't truly in charge. We have a supervisor, we have a boss. Well, my guest today, Clay Scroggins, wrote a book on this topic, and he's going to teach us how to lead through influence, even when we lack authority. Let's jump in. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Intentional Leader Podcast. My name is Cal, and I'm so fired up that you're here with us today. I am on a journey to try to learn to live and lead more intentionally because we know that when the leader gets better, lives get better. My guest today, Clay Scroggins, is a pastor, teacher, and author. He's a great speaker. He spoke at my church a few months ago, and I've just been a huge fan of his work. He wrote three books. First, How to Lead When You're Not in Charge. Second, how to Lead in a World of Distraction, a very relevant book for our time. And then he also wrote The Leader's Guide to the Future. I'm so excited that you're joining us here today, and I'm really excited for 2024. There's going to be a lot of wonderful content that we're going to be putting out through this community. When I say we, I'm really just talking about me and my wife. But uh, it's going to be fun. 2024 is an exciting year for this podcast. Uh, I'm really re-energized for what we have in store uh, for 2024. That rhymed. I didn't mean for that to rhyme. But anyway, it's going to be fun. It's going to be great. And uh, I hope you'll join us. If you're watching on YouTube or you're listening on your favorite podcast platform, please subscribe. That's the best way to make sure you don't miss any episodes. And I just want to encourage you this year as you're starting off, maybe your goals are right on track. If so, wonderful. Or maybe you're feeling a little bit discouraged, but I hope that this can be a place where we can learn and grow together. So without any further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Clay Scroggins. All right. Good morning. I'm here with Clay Scroggins. Clay, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks, Cal. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah. Happy New Year. I know you probably try to keep your content evergreen, but it's the beginning <laughs> it of the year. It is the new year. No, <laughs> no, I love it. And I was actually just listening to your recent episode this morning, just kind of reflecting on 2023 and thinking about the new year. And I really like to harness the energy of the, of the new year. I don't know about you. Um, I'm sure you do. Um, do you have any to, rituals? Oh, well, go ahead. It's your podcast. You need to no, ask no, questions. No, no, no. Well, it's, I do have some. I think, you know, you were talking about it this morning on the podcast episode I listened to for that you did. Um, I do think reflection is so important for me. So I yeah. think beyond just like the looking forward, which is super important, 100%, but I, I think it, I find the more I reflect on the last year, um, the more insights I get. One of my practices is I'll actually go through my photos that are on my oh, phone. Oh, we do I, the I just, same. Yeah. Oh, do you really? Yeah. I we just do that take as a, lot a family. Photos. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, I do. My wife and I typically do it together. And it's amazing what I forget in a totally. year. I'm like, I totally. I totally forgot that, you know, we went to that thing or I forgot we connected with that person. And I'll, I'll, I'll even like, you know, snap pictures of, you know, some books that I'm reading or quotes. And so it's just, it's a fun, uh, way to reflect and kind of celebrate a little bit too because yeah. i find that a lot yeah. of um a lot of goals can be uh almost like i don't know how to make this distinction perfectly but it's almost like some of our goals i think are out of a almost like a hatred or a a disdain for what we didn't do versus mm. like a love and an appreciation for what we accomplished and what we're being called into for them so anyway that's kind of a long-winded way of I do reflect a lot and then I do try to have a couple habits kind of process oriented that I'm that I'm focused new, on one of which this new year ones is, or uh, adding to them or changing them. yeah like this year I'm really yeah. focused on nutrition um I have a friend who's inspired me just to put more greens in my body um mm. not not so much try to subtract which he I appreciate his because I do there's a lot of foods out there I love <laughs> um but just trying to add more more good um, and then last year, if I had a word for last year, I would say it was rest. Mm. I think God really helped me see more and more how to rest. Uh, this year, actually, I think it's more work. Like I'm really excited to kind of lean into some things that uh, um, I stepped away from a little bit last year, and if, including this podcast. Honestly, this podcast, I, I, um, I, I intentionally stepped away just to kind of do some inner work. Um, mm. And I'm really excited now to kind of lean in, I think, from a healthier place this year. Well, I was going to tell you, thanks for doing this podcast, because I feel like you do it for the love of the game. I mean, you do it just <laughs> genuinely to help people, which mm. I think is just tremendous. Uh, mm. it, it's, it's such a great uh, platform to be able to put 
not just to put content out there, but just to put your voice out there, you know, and people need, uh, people need your voice. People need, um, we all need encouragement, inspiration, and you're, you're, uh, you're putting out some good vibes into the world. Mm. Well, thanks, Clay. That's yep. actually where I wanted to start with you. Um, one of the things I've, I've noticed, so you came and spoke at our church uh, in Charlottesville uh, about a month, a couple months ago. And, uh, and then I've read your content, your, your three books, and I've just noticed you have a very fun, playful, kind of joyful way about you. And you don't really take yourself too seriously. Even your website, it's just like, hey, text me if if you want to, you want to connect. I don't know if that's like your real number or not, but uh, it is, it is. That's my real number. Is it really? Wow. Yeah. And I yeah. just, I just really, I think that's super refreshing. And I wonder if you could just kind of speak to, cause you have a lot of leaders listening who are more senior. Um, and, and you also have, you know, leaders who will be, they will grow and in influence over time and they will find themselves with more and more opportunities. So how have you remained so grounded and, and just kind of fun and lighthearted. I just, I just really appreciate that. It's very refreshing in a, in a space that can be real intense and very ego driven. Well, I, uh, that's a kind compliment. I, I take that as a compliment. Not everybody would want to be seen as that, but I certainly, <laughs> no. that's certainly, you know, if, if I were to write out my values of what I want to be known as, um, not taking yourself too seriously is a, that is really important to me. I'll talk about why in just a second, but um, some of it's just temperament. I will say too. I mean, some of it's just mm -hmm. wiring, right? Just God given yeah. the way He's wired me. I was uh, one of uh, the senior superlative I got in high school was uh, wittiest, and so I've uh, always enjoyed yeah. humor. I've always enjoyed lightheartedness. Uh, it, you know, for those of you that Enneagram, I'm an Enneagram Seven. My wife oh, says nice. I'm an Enneagram Seven with a seven wing. I really just, I've got those, a are the, those are the funnest people to be around. I love that. <laughs> well, and some of the, 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 you know, some, they're sometimes exhausting as well. I mean, I can exhaust mm -hmm. people for sure, but I, I am in, the, I think the title of the seven is the enthusiast. I uh -huh. certainly have a lot of enthusiasm. I mean, people that yeah. work for me for a long time would have said that would, that would be one of the common things they would say. A lot of joy, a lot of enthusiasm, um, a lot of rah, rah, which obviously has some downside too, but mm -hmm. I feel like the, the value or the virtue of not taking yourself too seriously, I have found, um, is really important for emotional health and it's really important for connecting with people. Um, some of it I think is being a, I, I worked as a pastor for 20 years. And so I saw a lot of really hard things, yeah. um, sat with people through some really difficult things, uh, um, that, I, I would say the simple practice of going to a funeral every year should be a part of something all of us do because just the, um, the fact that we are all going to die and death is going to, you know, that ratio is one to one, mm -hmm. but the fact that there is an end date for all of us, I think should help us all. It, it should, it should make us take life more seriously and it should mm -hmm. take us it should allow us to take ourselves less seriously because um, the fact that we are not going to beat death in this life because of, you know, your faith and my faith that, that we share, we believe that God has defeated death on our behalf and there is a life beyond this life. But not taking yourself too seriously is just something that I think is important for leadership because it shows a vulnerability that we all have. We're all vulnerable. You know, for all we know, you and I are walking around with a disease that might kill us this week. Right. I mean, we don't yeah. know that. Right. Um, yeah. As far as I know, I'm somewhat healthy and you're eating all those greens. And so you're incredibly healthy. <laughs> starting, starting, yeah, yeah. Starting, to, to. starting to, <laughs> but I also just think, I think people need to, the people that work around us need to see that we are aware of our weaknesses, that we're aware of our strengths that um, we recognize, you know, one of the things I learned when I left, I left my job uh, in June of 2021, and I had that same thing that happened. I mean, you've left a job before, right? Yeah. When you leave a job, you think, oh, I'm going to make sure I'll give you all my, if you know, they have my phone or make sure you have my phone or my new email, because you're going to probably need to get in touch with me over the next couple months mm -hmm. about some of these projects we were working on. And I'm sure you're going to have me on speed dial. Um, this is embarrassing, Cal, but you know how many people called me after I left my job? <laughs> Zero. I mean, like, like relationships, said. friendships, whatever. Yeah, yeah. No one called me to say like, oh my goodness, we can't figure this out. How are you doing that? 
Wow. Life just moves on. Organizations yeah. just move on. Churches just yeah. move on. The military yes. certainly just moves on, right? Yes. And that yes. also, um, that awareness, I think, is something that is important to have when we leave, but it's even more important to have when we're still there because it just allows us to connect with people more deeply and allows us to put ourselves and our lives in proper context. So I think that's why that value or virtue is really yeah. important for me. Yeah, you, you said so much there. I, I, I'm curious, do you have kind of a, is there any kind of consistent practice that you have that helps you, uh, it, you mentioned your wiring, so maybe it's just, you just innate in you, but do you have any kind of consistent uh, thought pattern or, or practice or habit that keeps you keeping things more light and fun? And, that, and I, the reason I ask, some of this is selfish, I recently <clears throat> came upon a book that I haven't read, but I love the title, and it just, it's called Feel Good Productivity. Uh, it's by a, a guy named Ali Abdal, and I've, I've watched some some videos on it. But he, his whole thing is just like life is so much more fun when you just make work as fun as you can, you know. And and you know the whole whistle while you work, and and then that, mm-hmm. I know uh, Greg McEwen's written on this and Effortless. But um, I'm just curious, do you have any kind of practice that kind of reminds you to be fun and, and upbeat and joyful, or do you think it just kind of comes naturally? It, it is a big part of your wiring. There are probably some things that I do that I don't even realize I do, but I will say a lot of it probably is real natural. I, you know, for me, I'm, I'm on a, I, I'm a, I speak for a living. I, I do a lot of preaching and do a lot of corporate speaking. And that's just a really big, I, I noticed that probably when I was really studying the craft of preaching and speaking publicly in my late twenties and early thirties, I started noticing the people that I liked listening to were ones that I could tell really enjoyed what they were doing. Mm-hmm. and. I, that's just something I tell myself probably now it's just so ingrained in me, but Mm. I mean, I'm working on a Sunday, I'm preaching at a church in, uh, let's see, oh, Dallas, I'm in Dallas, Texas on Sunday. Um, I've got an event next week that I'm speaking at and I will certainly, as I'm looking through the content, I'll be thinking where, where am I excited? What, what is exciting me? What am I, um, going to enjoy talking about you got it you know speaking i don't know how much you want to talk about public speaking i enjoy talking about that no, a lot, i was but- actually one of the things i want to talk about was communication with you and how and how because you're a very effective speaker really oh, engaging, very you. funny you know which i think does endear people towards you and it makes it, it makes for a memorable sticky experience but yeah i wanted to ask you about kind of communication well, the having that uh, in the in the church world, we would call it that burden. But I would say mm-hmm. it's true, even whatever kind of corporate speaking or even speaking to your team or your associates at work, you got to find that burden, that thing that is burning hot within you that you, hey, I believe so deeply that this can change your life or this will make a difference in our clients or make a difference in the people that we're trying to serve and learning how to um, let that burden it, you know, sometimes it is fueled by if we don't do this, there's going to be something that's lost. Mm-hmm. But I think also reminding ourselves to look at the other side of, hey, if we do this, think about all that can change. Now, I will say human motives. If you look at the, the data around what motivates people more, uh, avoiding regret or m- making good decisions to enjoy a benefit people are more motivated by the avoiding regret. They're more motivated by the, the negative side of, um, I, you know, if, if this is going to end my life, I want to avoid it versus, no, this is going to help make your life better. Um, so, so back to your simple, I know we're harping on this greens habit that you mentioned, but that, that simple little change in behavior, what's more motivating to people is if you don't eat the greens, it will take your life. Yeah. That's more yeah. motivating, unfortunately, to us as humans than... If you eat the greens, imagine how much better you'll feel as a human, which is just kind of interesting psychology as humans. But I do think seeing both sides of that, but that burden is the, to me, it really is the, it's, it's essential to speaking in front of people, but learning how to have that burden in a way that um, can be joy filled and not just fear mongering, I think is really helpful and important, particularly in our society today. Yeah, you're, I mean, you, you really are a, a very, very effective speaker. I know that a lot of that, I'm sure too, just, you've just got a lot of reps getting up and speaking. A lot of reps. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that transitions me a little bit. So you were the, uh, around 30 years old, right? When you got, uh, placed and promoted into the position leading, was it North Point's largest campus at the time? 
or no, uh, I, or I, one I, my, my career, the quick career trajectory for me is I, I worked in, I went to Georgia Tech, studied engineering. I went to seminary to study theology, met a girl, ended up studying her. Ha. Huh. Um, <laughs> that's <laughs> well done. Well done. Um, but it is true. <laughs> Uh, I, I worked in student ministry in my throughout my 20s. I uh, worked in a, a church organization in the Atlanta area that um, is a multi-site organization. And so it's real similar to multi-site, you know, any any business or company or nonprofit, any, you know, the multi-site concept of really trying to have similar culture, but able to scale it. Um, this mm-hmm. church that I worked with, we were able to scale church in a way, which churches scaled well traditionally through denominations. And but we essentially scaled throughout Atlanta and then throughout some parts of the U.S. as well. And I did a lot of student ministry, but then eventually ran one of our locations. Yeah, when I was 30 years old, got tapped to do that. So you know that that's just for context. Uh, that would have been a you know I was 30 years old leading a staff of, of about 50. Uh, the church would have been on a Sunday about 6,000 and then got moved when I was about 34, 35 to lead uh, uh, North Point, the campus in Alpharetta that the church all started out of. So that would have, some people call it, the, you know, it was, oh, the main campus. I used to joke with people and say, well, it's not the main campus. Do you have any main children? Right. Because we really tried <laughs> to see them all the same. Uh, mm-hmm. But it was the original one. It was the largest one. And then eventually when I was, I guess I was 38 or 37, they asked me to move to Buckhead, which is a mm-hmm. Uh, one of the campus we have inside the city of Atlanta. So um, the, it's kind of the shopping entertainment district of Atlanta. Um, and that's where, that's where we live now. But that was, I, I was in that job for about three years till I, 2021 when I resigned and now got speak for a living. So yeah, that's kind of the career trajectory. Yeah, but yes, I was uh, fairly young to be leading something uh, yeah. of that magnitude for me. Well, and it's really, it's, it's, it's really neat as you, so I'm going to hold up for those that are watching on YouTube. This is um, the book, how not, or how to lead when you're not in charge, which is a great title. Um, and I, and I, and the book does a great job of getting into the how to lead when you're not in charge. And for you, I wonder if you could just maybe start with that light bulb moment when you're a little over 30 or just past 30 and you're getting put in charge of this, this large campus. You're leading under Andy Stanley, who many probably know of uh, as a very uh, prominent pastor uh, in the Christian church and um, also has a leadership podcast. So I, I'm just kind of walk us through because you, you, you have a lot of credibility already just from having that leadership experience. But then you wrote a book that's just super helpful for anyone. And I'll just for those that are listening, you know, maybe you've had those thoughts where like, man, I just. I could be so great if my boss would just listen or man, if my boss would just listen to some of my ideas or, you know, they're stuck in the past and you do such a great job in this book of getting us away from our kind of tendency. And I I put myself a hundred percent in this category of just blaming and it's not maybe overt. It's a lot of it's inside my head. of just like, I'm blaming other people for why I'm not more effective or I'm the victim of my own, you know, I would be so much more successful if my boss would just listen. So anyway, take us to that moment, or, you know, shortly after you're 30, where you kind of have that light bulb moment of, of really those convictions that led to writing this book. Well, I love that you, the way you just put that using those, um, if only, right. Mm-hmm. If only my boss would, that, that, that was it for me. I mean, it, mm-hmm. I just kept having those moments of, and, and unfortunately, it, it really, um, I, thought it w- I thought I would find relief from that as I got promoted, mm-hmm. but it actually got worse as I got promoted. And so I, you know, when I was in my associate, you know, in an associate role, I, th- I thought, well, this makes sense because I'm not the boss yet. If only yeah. I could get my boss's job. And then, yeah. I, and then I got my boss's job. And I thought, okay, here we go. Now I'm going to really now be I'm able to. Now in charge. Yeah, yeah. Now, now I'm in charge. Now I'm going to be able yeah, to yeah. do all the things that I've wanted to do, which, you know, that's, that's not uncommon to any human. Every one of us has that thing inside of us. I believe it is in the fabric of your DNA, no matter who you are, no matter what you do, no matter what level you're at, that you want to build something, you want to create something, you want to move something forward, you want to organize something, you want something to flourish. And however you, However you go about doing that is really what leadership is. And so obviously you can be a leader from any position in any organization at any level at any point in time. But the key is to figure out, well, how do you lead when you don't have 
supreme authority, which none of us obviously will ever have it. But I started when I, when I got that promotion, as you mentioned, when I was 30, that's really when I, I started experiencing it the most those next couple of years, because I was in a, I was in a, it was a, the biggest leadership position I'd ever been in, but I still had more bosses than I thought I should have or would have had. And I had more people who were saying, Hey, um, I like your idea, but that's not the way we're going to do it. And so, and I would do just what you just said. I would go, well, if only they would see it my way, or if only they would get out of the way or, um, and, and the truth is that's not how leadership works. That that's a, that's an authority based view of leadership that we've all grown up with that, uh, I, I call it, it's leveraging the weapon of authority, right? It's waving the gun around going, I'm in charge, do what I tell you to do. And since I'm in charge, you're going to do what I tell you to do. And that just doesn't, it doesn't work, which I'm, I'm interested to have the conversation with you about the military. Cause I do cite the military as one of the places where there is such a chain of command and authority right. probably, uh, it, it, if it's ever going to work, it works in the military. However, I think we all know the best kind of leadership is when we're leading through influence. And so if yeah. you can do that when you're not in charge, excuse me, if you can learn how to do that when you're not in charge, you'll be that much better of a leader when you are in charge. Because I love that line. There's a line from Game of Thrones. I, I, I never actually saw Game of Thrones, but I had someone come up and tell me this after a, after a talk that I did on this topic where um, someone, the, the, the wise character in Game of Thrones says, anyone who has to tell everyone they're the king is no king at all. And I love that concept of going, Hey, yeah. if you think that mm -hmm. you got to have the title, the position, the authority to get people yeah. to do what you think needs to happen, mm -hmm. you've lost already. Yeah. So that's the concept. That's really where the book started <clears throat> and what it's, that's really the essence of it as well. Yeah, no. It, and it's, I mean, it's such a great book. Um, and it seems like it, it seems like it's resonated with a lot of people. Um, what, what do you think about it has resonated most? I mean, it does, it makes sense to me, but I'm just curious from your perspective, what, what seems to, why, why do people seem to get so excited about this concept? I think the title, when I bumped into the title, um, I just, it, as I look back now, it's such a gift from God. I, I was mm -hmm. a campus pastor trying to figure out what I was learning and I was doing some journaling and I wrote down, I'm trying to learn how to lead, even though I'm not in charge. Oh, and wow. the thing that I, and this is just for anybody who's building a keynote, I, you know, or anybody who's thinking about writing a book, if you can find a title that mm -hmm. both exposes the need and makes a promise in the title, you got something. And yeah. so I've, I've had a couple of books since then that haven't performed near as well that I think the content, I enjoy the content just as yeah, much and feel just content. as passionate about it. But the title of the book, both exposes or reveals this need that I have. Oh, I'm not in charge and I'm trying to figure out how do I lead. But it also, uh, there's a promise baked in there that if you read this, uh, I'll come alongside and show you how to do that. So I, I think that's why it's resonated with people because of that, uh, the duality of the title. And so in the book, you talk about this, this exchange with Andy Stanley, where, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of going back and forth and, and, there's something like the, the content that they were giving you, because this is a larger campus, I assume that's giving you certain content that you work from and maybe make your own in some way. Um, but there was just like, it, it was this mindset that you had that like, well, the content's just limiting us. And you had this conversation with Andy and tell us kind of his response and how that, how that shifted the way you were thinking at the time. Yeah, it, think about it like, uh, you know, if you're running a, a restaurant, a franchise type restaurant, you know, the central organization gives you the menu, they give yeah. you the, you know, they give you the, the food that's on the menu, and then your job is to sell it well and to serve customers well. That's essentially the way that we were running things as a multi-site church, that we were getting the content from the central organization, then our job was to deliver it. And so um, I really was, I was filled with blame. I was, uh, I was, I had taken on a victim mindset that he was frustrated about some things that he had seen or things that he had heard. And he was asking me, why is it this way? And I'm, I was just going, well, because they're giving us not great content. They're giving it to us 
you know, not in a timely fashion. And then so it's no wonder that we're not able to execute yeah. on it well or we're able to deliver it well. And yeah. I just remember him looking there, look, sitting there with this befuddled look like <laughs> you would deliver poor content because someone gave you poor content. Like what kind of leader would do that? <laughs> and I'm go as I'm sitting there, it's like, you know, that moment, Cal, when you're like, you know, you, you worked out and you maybe sprayed some deodorant or something and then went to a meeting <laughs> hoping that you were, had covered it up. But then you're there in the meeting going fine. like, no one will know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no one will know. And then you're like, do I smell? I, I <laughs> Is smell that me? myself. Is that me? <laughs> exactly. That's the way. Yeah, it actually, I do know me. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Most people are familiar with that. But I remember sitting in that meeting being like, I'm smelling something that's <laughs> off and I think it's He's me. He's talking about me, right? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So that, yeah, it just hit me that I was like, oh, okay, that when you blame, blame is such a, it's such a um, helpful tactic because it allows us to smuggle our own problems into yeah. the future. And that's exactly what I was doing is I was smuggling my own poor leadership into the future mm -hmm. when I, I should have taken ownership and said, you know, hey, um, we are figuring out how to change it in real time and then also figuring out how to have some of those hard conversations about what they're giving us and why it's not working. Um, but that's, that's what a great leader would do. That's what someone who's leading when they're not in charge would do. But instead, I was, I was going, well, I don't have the authority. I'm not in charge. And so therefore, I can't do what needs to be done to make this great. And he, he, did, it, he did it very kindly, very tactfully, just asking me, you know, Really? Like, is that what you would? Huh? Okay. Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah, that's that was the moment when it really set in most that that led me on this journey of going, all right. So, leadership is not about a title. It's not about power. It's not about a position or authority. It really is about learning how to cultivate influence from the seat that you're in. So, what do I need to do? And so, in the book, I just give four big concepts of what yeah. anyone can do, or I think you know would be better if they did. Uh, that would help them cultivate more influence in the seats they're in. So let's go through some of those just real quick. Um, so you talk about, um, and I, one, get the book because the book just really lays this out super well. We're just going to cover, cover just a few today. Um, but the first one is just lead yourself, lead the person in the mirror. And actually this intentional leader, that's a big focus for us on self-leadership. Um, it's the core of, I think, everything we, we lead out of who we are. We lead out of how well we, we lead ourselves. So just give us, a, give us a few thoughts on that. If that's like the first step. Okay, so you've acknowledged, hey, I'm, maybe I've got a mindset. And, do, and for those that are listening right now, think about like how, when are you having those thoughts where maybe you're, you're blaming someone else for something that maybe you could help make better? Uh, or there's something that there's some dream that you have or some desire, some, something out there that you want to accomplish, but deep down you're, you're not leaning into it because you are, you know, stuck in, in the blame cycle and the victim, you know, you're just a victim. And, and I, I say this in all humility, I, this is certainly something I deal with all the time. Um, so we tell all us, do, like, yeah. give us a little coaching on this, the starting, uh, place or the, some, a few simple steps for beginning to lead ourselves better. I, when I, um, I do a little bit of coaching, one-on-one -on -one professional coaching. And whenever I start to hear a lot of, um, frustration or, you know, discouragement, whatever it may be in someone, I, I like to say, Hey, let, let, let me grab, let, let's grab an org chart, just like a general org chart of your organization Cir circle where the crux of your problems are. And what most people do is they circle above them. You know, mm -hmm. my bosses are, you know, either you know, whatever, they're not doing what I want them to do. Or there's this central organization or another department, but very rarely do they circle underneath them because that is what we're most in charge. That's what you have the most mm -hmm. control over. And, and to your point, this is a very elementary principle. I remember our preschooler came home from preschool and I asked him, I mean, he's a, he's a boy. So his most common answer for things is, you know, good or fine. But I remember asking him, Hey, what did you learn at school today? And he looks up at me with these big bright eyes and he said, I am in charge of me. And I remember thinking nice. like that, that doesn't seem like great theology, right? Because I mean, he was doing, he was at this preschool at our church, which I'm like, uh -huh. you know, great theology is no, God is in charge of me. Right. right yeah, but the reality yeah. is no, there's a personal responsibility that we all have that what I am most in charge of is leading me. And I, I, yeah. I saw this recently. Um, I spoke to the university of Texas uh, faculty of their medical mm -hmm. school. 
Cool. And I, I remember getting done with the talk. I sit down at this table and ask some of the uh, men and women there just what their responses were. And this guy said, oh, I am so it's really it's just made me think about how frustrated I am with our administration. Mm-hmm. And I was like, tell me more about how that talk made you think. But whatever, you know, people people <laughs> always hear what they want to hear, you know. And so he goes, well, um, they're just not doing this. And I was like, OK, tell me more. And he's like, I mean, I've told them for years we need a mentoring program. That I didn't, when I started this job, I'm 60 years old now. And when I started it 30 years ago, I didn't know what I was doing. No one taught me. No one helped me. I had to figure it out on my own. And we need to be doing that for anybody who comes on our faculty. We need to have some kind of mentor program. And I love asking, uh, as soon as, you know, he's saying all that, I'm, you know, the, the, the blame, the scent of uh-huh. blame is, yeah. is yeah. very strong. And I love asking audiences. I love telling that story and then asking the audience, you know, okay, what is something he could have done? to lead himself well in that moment, you know? And then a lot of times people go, oh, he could have started a mentor program, which is true. He could have, but a step before starting a mentor program would be he could have led himself to go mentor someone. Yes. You don't have to have a program to go be generous to someone else. But again, that's self-leadership because if you would have asked him at the time, well, why don't you do that? He'll say, well, because I'm too busy or I got too much going on or I don't know that I have anything to offer, which are all things that we've got to lead ourselves in, right? That you've got to, it's about managing your own calendar. It's about prioritizing what's most important, finding your own motivation, learning how to be an others focused kind of leader. And that, um, that, that process of learning how to lead yourself well is not easy to do. In fact, it's the most difficult, but it is the most essential to cultivating influence because if 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 you if you can't lead yourself well then you're not ready to lead others this is, jesus said it this way he said if you're trusted if you can be faithful with what's in front of you guess what he'll do he will trust you to lead more so it's that same principle and what's most in front of you is is yourself so nothing yeah. so conclusively proves your ability to lead others is what you do on a day-to-day basis to lead yourself it's so good. And it, it, it's, it shows up in so many different contexts. I mean, you can think about it even in the family uh, situation. I mean, I, I think about things that I want to do or like even just this nutrition idea. I want to eat more greens. Well, you know what? I have total control over yep. that. I really do. I you mean, could, I can blame. You could blame like, your wife. You could blame oh, the grocery yeah, store. Oh, you you know, could blame. We bring this food in or this <clears throat> food's available or it's hard to pack my lunch, whatever. But it really is. At the end of the day, it's on me. And it, I think part of this is it's kind of a hard reality because it does require like really looking in the mirror and saying, yeah, it's on you. You know, it, it really, you can, you can bring about change. And obviously there's a, like we said, there's a theological component of this. I'm not saying that like everything, there, there is a power beyond me for sure that, that gives me uh, all kinds of, of power and encouragement and, um, is, in, is ultimately in control, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot that, I've been given to steward and uh, well said. and I, yep. I just think you do such a great job in the book of laying that out. So guys, I, I really, and gals I encourage you to check out um, that section, especially because there's, it's, it's a master class on self-leadership. And uh, I know that those that listen uh, really appreciate that, that concept. I want to talk real quick about kind of the contrast. So you, so you, you came and spoke at our church um, and it's interesting. I was speaking to some people afterwards, some of my friends, and, and they were so fired up by the content. Because you talked about being positive, which is one of the other principles, but at the same time, kind of rejecting uh, passivity and being mm-hmm. and being willing to be critical. So you kind of mm-hmm. layered on top like these concepts that could be viewed as you you either are one or the other. Like you either are a positive person, um, or you're someone who's very uh, you know forward leaning. You're not passive, or you're a positive person, but you're not critical. Like those two things can't go together, but I think you, yeah. uh, and it made me actually think of wisdom, just the idea of wisdom and how it's the ability to kind of navigate these seemingly um, at odds concepts in a way that's, that's effective. But talk to us a little bit. I know there's a, there's a lot, we can talk about that for hours. And I know you do talk about that for hours, but just a few thoughts if you could about just being positive while at the same time being willing to be critical and kind of not passive um, yeah. and, and, you know, being as, as someone who's in an organization who's maybe not in charge, but you can, there's a lot of things you can do uh, in those managing those principles. 
Yeah, the, 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 the idea of positivity is really about your attitude, right? It's about the, the way you're posturing yourself at work. And if you can't get behind the organization that you work for, if you can't get under and support the person that you're working for, you got to look in the mirror and you potentially need to go do something different because it is, it is not, it, it is the, the greatest opportunity we have to affect other people is it's the attitude we bring. Right. And, and it, and we all think, no, no, it's my education, my experience, my ideas, my talent. No, no, no. It is your energy. It's the, the posture in which you bring yourself to work every day. And if you can't be a forward thinking, anything's possible, nothing can stop us. This thing can get better and we're going to help it grow and we're going to climb this mountain kind of person, hope filled kind of leader. Uh, it is going to be tough for you to cultivate influence because positivity is just so incredibly powerful i always think about the nfl season because i'm such a i'm a big sports fan so pardon yeah, yeah. the sports illustration but <laughs> you know we're, we're toward the we're toward the end of the season right now but there's a bunch of teams that are still in the playoff race but things aren't going well maybe they're coming off a loss or they've had an injury what do yeah. they need in that locker room right now yeah they need right. some men that are willing to go it is not over we have hope we can do this anything is possible they need that kind of positive spirit. And whoever has it, people are going to look at them and think like, bro, you're out to lunch. Are you kidding me? Or are you not in touch with reality? But you got to have that. You got to have the, yeah. that posture. But then to your point, you also have to have, you can't just walk around. I call it being a rainbow puking unicorn. You can't just walk <laughs> around going everything is awesome all the time, right? Uh -huh. 2020 taught us that. Um, 2020, we had to learn this really interesting dynamic where we had to be in touch with reality. If you weren't, people wouldn't have listened to you. But you also had to be someone that was a force for good, that was optimistic, that was forward thinking, that was solution oriented. And if you could be both of those, if you could learn how to carry yourself in a posture of positivity, but also a person that was grounded in the reality of things need to change, things need to get better, things need to be different, and I'm going to help us get there. You got to be able to have both of those. And the first one Positivity is a, it's a posture you carry yourself in, but thinking critically, it's a skill that we can hone. It's a mm -hmm. skill that we have to bring to work. And so you're right. It's not just this bubble gum pie in the sky. Everything is awesome all the time. That's not the kind of leader that's going to cultivate influence, but you do have to have an attitude of positivity, but you have to couple that with this skill of I'm, I am spending time thinking about how to make this better. And I am aware, I'm, I have thoughts and ideas on how to do it that are solution oriented, that are constructive and not just destructive. And I'm bringing that with intention uh, and not passivity. Uh, you, you will never passively find what you do not actively pursue. And so it is about being willing to go, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to come to this meeting with thoughts and ideas, even though I'm not in charge of the meeting. I'm going to spend time thinking about how to make our culture better. I'm going to spend time thinking about how to solve our biggest problems. I'm going to be worried about and concerned about what's bothering the boss, but I'm going to do it with a sense of positivity. If you can do that, you'll cultivate influence, which really is the, uh, the essence of leadership. Which is a beautiful concept because you can, you can take it anywhere. You don't have to have a position or a title, uh, but what you lay out in this book allows you to, to have influence and impact wherever you are at home, at work, in your community. Um, Clay, I want to uh, also just commend your other books. I uh, I listened to How to Lead in a World of Distraction, and you do such a good job with the audio book, by the way. I mean, like your, oh, well, your stories you. are really engaging. And uh, I mean, you could just, it's not, because I, I listened to a fair number of audio books. And you know, a lot of them, you could just tell the authors aren't speakers. And uh, so anyway, I, I just encourage folks to check out your audio books as well. Uh, also, The Asp Aspiring Leader's Guide to the Future. Um, another great book where you really look, I really enjoyed, by the way, your, your interview with Kerry Newhoff on that, where you really look towards the future. And I know he does a great job of just kind of thinking about trends. Yeah, he's very futuristic um, in that way. Yeah. But I encourage folks to check both of those out. But Clay, we got one minute left. What would be uh, the best way for people to, to track with you, to find you, to connect with your, your work? Yeah, I, I have a podcast called How to Lead. You know, uh, uh, it's a weekly deposit to leaders trying to help them lead better. There's a weekly newsletter I do. You can go to my website, claycecroggins.com to see that. But I, I really just feel really grateful for you taking your time to shine your light 
uh, on me. And I would just also say to any leader out there that feels discouraged today or just feels like, man, I'm just not, I don't feel it today. Uh, I would just encourage you that this is those seasons sometimes of discouragement. Those are the times where God does his best work. Mm. And so if you are discouraged, I would just encourage you to um, tell God that to tell, you know, whatever your prayer practice is, I would just be open to saying that out loud and then recognizing that the the hard that you're in the middle of is going to bring some good because that's what hard does. Anytime we push through hard, there's good on the other side yeah. and we do, we, we learn the most, we grow the most when we're in the middle of some of those hard seasons. And so I just hope that, uh, I hope this is an encouraging uh, episode, but I also hope it's an encouraging year for all of your, uh, the, the, the listeners to this podcast that you might, um, continue to grow and continue to see the ways in which, uh, you're able to impact the world, to be a force for good in whatever position, whatever location, whatever job, whatever seat that you find yourself in. That's a good word. I, I that definitely resonates with me. So, well, Clay, I really appreciate your time. Uh, look forward to staying connected as we both move along this journey. And, uh, thanks for the great work you're doing. Yeah. Thanks for what you do, Cal. Well, hello, friend. Thank you. You made it to the end of the episode. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope this was an episode that brought value to you and your life and your leadership. A special thanks to Clay Scroggins for joining us today. If you'd like to get future content, you can go to my website, calwalters.me. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. I hope you go and have a wonderful day. Remember that life is short. Let's go make it count.